Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos a mais um grande evento do Labô. Uh, hoje nós temos o grande, grande prazer de receber uh, a professora Susan Niemann, convidada pelo nosso embaixador do Labô, o professor Fernando Ahmed, do coordenador do Grupo de Comportamento Político. É uma honra ter todos vocês aqui, uma honra receber a professora Susan. Uh, eu vou falar algumas coisinhas em português e como a gente tem muitas questões, muitas, muito, muito bate-papo aqui, a gente vai, eu, eu, eu pretendo não me estender, gente, vocês me perdoem só por esses segundinhos. Primeiro lugar, a professora Susan é filósofa, ensaísta e diretora do Einstein Forum na Alemanha, foi professora de Yale e da Universidade de Tel Aviv e autora de vários livros. O livro mais conhecido dela aqui no Brasil, o único a ser traduzido até agora, é o que vocês conhecem, O Mal no Pensamento Moderno. Aliás, quem não viu esta grande aula com o professor Andrei Venturini, depois vejam a aula de segunda-feira que está gravada aqui no Facebook. Além disso, o último livro da professora Susan é Learning from the Germans, ainda sem tradução aqui no Brasil. Hoje a gente vai fazer uma coisinha um pouco diferente, crianças, que é o seguinte... A gente não vai fazer sim, simplesmente um labo lecture, simplesmente uma fala da professora Susan. Nós chamamos duas pesquisadoras incríveis do nosso grupo de judaísmo contemporâneo, coordenado por mim e pelo Rubem, uh, para participar desse evento, a Juliana e a Ludmilla. E isso é um grande prazer nosso aqui no Labo, porque é exatamente isso, a gente colocar... A, a, os nossos pesquisadores para dialogarem com, também com a gente, com a, o mundo acadêmico, enfim, e tudo mais. Então, eu estou uh, muito feliz de apresentar as meninas para vocês. A Juliana é colunista da Folha, doutoranda em filosofia e literatura alemã pela University College in Cork, na Irlanda, e mestre em filosofia pela Universidade de Tel Aviv. A querida Ludmilla, doutoranda em Ciência Política na Universidade Livre de Berlim e mestre em Direito pela UFBA. E também vice-coordenadora do Centro de Estudos na área e pesquisadoras do meu grupo, gente, do Grupo de Judaísmo. E a gente <risos> puxa a sardinha. E como, obviamente, os assuntos, a convidada do professor Fernando e a professora convidada do Labo vai discutir essa questão de, de judaísmo contemporâneo, nada mais bacana do que a gente chamar nossos pesquisadores. Pensem nisso, pesquisadores do Labo que estão ouvindo a gente, porque isso é uma iniciativa que a gente quer repetir muito. Bom, parei de falar, agradeço ao Andrei, agradeço ao Fernando por estarem e agradeço vocês, Juliana e Ludmilla. Professor Susan, it's such an honor to have you here with us. Uh, we are more than happy. And uh, maybe next year, or maybe one day we are going to meet in person, you are more than invited to come here to Sao Paulo and uh, to talk to us. Well, I would love to come sometime. Uh, I've never been to Brazil. And uh, particularly after getting these wonderful, uh, thoughtful questions, I would love to be able to talk to you and your research group. Um, it, would be, it would be a pleasure. Thank you so much. Juliana, please. Professor Neiman, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you here today with us. I've been uh, following your work now for several years. I think since I arrived in Tel Aviv for the first time as an MA student. So it's great to see you here and, uh, and to have the chance to, to ask you a few questions. So I'd like to start by a very general question, but it's a question that really comes to my mind when uh, when I, I, I find an intellectual that's, a, that's in, the, in a deep dialogue with German thought, and that's not a, a native German like ourselves. So I remember this text by Susan Zontag by, from when she got the Friedens Prize in 2003, where she talks about the experience of discovering German letters uh, in elementary school through one of her teachers that gave her a copy of the sufferings of, young, of the young Werther for her to read. So coming from a German department and uh, being a foreigner in love with German culture, uh, how did you discover German letters? What was your path to, to the world of German philosophy? Well, it certainly didn't start in uh, elementary school. Um, and <laughs> I could make it easy on myself by saying, well, 
probably the first serious philosopher I read was Nietzsche, uh, who I still think is an incredibly important philosopher, even though I deeply disagree with so much of what he said. Um, and then I could also make it easy on myself by saying, uh, I started working on Kant in graduate school um, for a number of reasons, I think partly because I found so much of contemporary uh, philosophy rather boring. And that drew me to the enlightenment and to the idea that as even Immanuel Kant, was uh, writing for not just for other philosophers, but for a broader public and was engaged in the public issues of his day in a way that unfortunately most Anglo-American philosophers are not. There are a few exceptions, but not very many. Uh, and so then it was a normal thing for me to do, to win the fellowship, to spend what I thought was going to be a year in Berlin, uh, improving my German and learning a bit about German philosophy and then going back uh, to the States and you know going on my academic path. But looking back on, of course, it's not quite true. I think like many people, I was fascinated by the Nazi period, even though I didn't know much about it. I was fascinated by the question, you know, how did the land of Goethe and Kant, uh, you know, uh, fall into uh, the barbarism that it fell into? And I wanted to see for myself. It was also, I must say, when I first came to Berlin in 1982, it, that was breaking a taboo. And I've always yeah. been a little bit um, <laughs> of a taboo breaker. Uh, there were very few Jews in Berlin, virtually none, really. Um, I knew one other American Jew. I now told there were two others that I didn't meet at the time. But that was, it was it was very unusual, and uh, you know there were not North Americans uh, unless they were part of the army. There was mm -hmm. a fairly large group of Chilean exiles. In fact, those became a lot of my closer friends. Yeah, who left after the yeah. On both East and West, interestingly enough. Uh, there's still a Salvador Allende hospital and you know, a few things like, I think it's street named. But um, what immediately struck me when I first got to Berlin was the intensity with which people were concerned with facing the Nazi past. Mm -hmm. Now, this was not from the government, this was not even a popular movement, but the sort of people that I would normally gravitate to, that is intellectuals and activists and artists were all preparing for the 50th anniversary of the Nazi assumption to power, which took place in 1933. And they were, you know, furious at their parents and teachers who had either been Nazis or not done anything to, uh, to stop them. And they were exploring local history and writing plays and making films about it. And I was immediately struck by what, uh, you know, the contrast between that and what the U.S., was doing mm -hmm. what a comparable group of people in the US was doing. And sort of, I, I didn't even go very far back into US history. I'm just thinking, why don't we talk about Vietnam? Now that the war is over, we never talk about it. Uh, we never talked about Hiroshima. And, uh, you know, so, so that became in a way, that was the beginning of the much later book uh, that I just wrote, Learning from the Germans, thinking about this process that Germans call Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung, mm -hmm. working through the past. But I guess what, you know, the, the most immediate fruit of that time, although it took me some years to finally write it, um, was this thought, reading Enlightenment philosophers talking about the Lisbon earthquake and, you know, the kind of repercussions that that had for understanding evil. And then it just struck me that there was a parallel um, to thinking about Auschwitz in modern thought, although very few philosophers, uh, Hannah Arendt was one of the very few who really uh, actually engaged philosophically. Adorno and Horkheimer did to some extent as well. Nobody in the English speaking tradition did, um, but uh, I guess that's where, that's where both of those books 
uh, began. Excellent, excellent. Uh, just, uh, 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 I think Ludmila would like to ask you a question more directed to Hannah Arendt. Sure. You're muted. Your, your, your mic is mute. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so <laughs> I think I got a little bit emotional. That's why, because I have the chance to talk with you and your work. I'm using your work in my research. Well, I, I work with Hannah Arendt and I like the way um, you go through the question of evil. I think it's very uh, interesting and this possibility of an, another conversation about the question, as you say, it's not very debated and yes, that's why I was very glad when Andrea uh, invited me to join this conversation. And yeah. as an Arendtian, I have some Hannah Arendt questions give, uh, made. Um, in the first, in, in the third part of Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt um, starts with a quote from Jean Cocteau, no? without the devil, uh, God would be inhuman. And that was, uh, that's this quotation, uh, every time I, I read it and I think about the question of evil, uh, for me, it comes to this um, thought that evil is necessary for goodness. And uh, it, it, like some sort of condition to goodness since it brings suffering it is suffering purifies the soul and reveals the inner moral of an individual. Uh, but as Arendt say that the evil being banal, as she says, as it can come from the most trivial situations, isn't the relation of evil to suffering or goodness an attempt of human reason to make sense of something that is senseless? Isn't the search for reasons uh, for evil also the search for meaning in the world? Giving evil a reason may make it easier to be good since the reasons for being evil give us also the reason to be good since we can understand what is going on and take uh, and choose it. No? If there is a reason for being evil, there is also a reason to be good. And if there is something behind this, this terrible facts that come from God or from the, the hands of man, so we can, in a certain way, think that there is a meaning in the world as itself, that it's not pure randomness, that it's not that the world, the, the, the inner laws of the world is just uh, unjust with no reason at all. And so our lives would be also meaningless. Wow, those are, um, those are some extremely complicated questions. Let me try to answer them uh, in turn. First of all, I'm not sure what to make of the Cocteau quote. Um, I really, um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I don't like the idea that evil is necessary for goodness. That is a Leibnizian theodicy. That's really exactly what Leibniz says. And the problem with Leibniz, of course, is that he uses these really, you know, banal examples. He says, well, without dark, we couldn't be light, without shadows. And, or he says, you know, you can't, uh, you know, People might be upset if the rain falls on their picnic, but the flower, or the, the farmers need the rain to grow their crops. And so we live in the best of all possible worlds. Those are really cheap examples, right? Because we're not talking about spoiling a picnic when we talk about evil, you know? Um, so I would be absolutely hesitant to, um, you know, to endorse any kind of a view that says, well, you know, evil is necessary for goodness because if there weren't evil, what would we fight against? This, this just seems like, uh, like a very dangerous path 
to go down. I mean, it's Hegelian too, of course. Um, it's basically what Hegel says. Um, you know, that's just part of moving history forward and all of that. I, I, um, you know, there were terrible evils before the 20th century also, but it strikes me that anybody who has ever looked at them seriously could not possibly justify, you know, the worst evils of colonialism and slavery or, or massacres that took place by saying, well, you know, it gives people a chance to be good. So, so that seems to me an offensive, uh, an offensive kind of a view. What I did in Evil and Modern Thought, and you're absolutely right, that I think the question about, you know, evil is a question about the meaning of life in the world. That's exactly, you know, it, it sometimes people think that it's only a religious question. And I think that was what was one of the things that was new in my book was to say, no, 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 Re religion is one possible answer to the problem of evil, but it's not ultimately a religious question. It's a question that every child asks. You know, anytime a child sees something that they find unfair, right? Yes. Um, they are asking, um, you know, what am I supposed to do? How do I orient myself in a world where things are unfair? Hopefully, you know, children don't get to see, you know, extreme examples of evil, but of course some of them do, as we know. Um, so what I did in the book was instead of, in, in Evil and Modern Thought, instead of dividing philosophers into, you know, empiricists and rationalists, which is a standard, standard way of looking at it. And that's, of course, uh, only a view that you can have if you believe that the most important philosophical question is, how do we know anything? I don't think that's the most important philosophical question. I think that has been, uh, you know, well, um, in a certain way, I wrote the book because I was just deeply annoyed at the narrative of modern philosophy that you get with someone like Richard Rorty in Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, which is that it's all about knowledge and indeed proving the existence of the external world. Um, if you actually look at more than a couple of texts in the history of, of philosophy, you just see that's not true. And that actually a guiding question uh, I won't say it's the only question, but a guiding question through the history of modern Western philosophy is um, how do we find meaning in life in given the presence of evil? What do we do with it? And, you know, I, I like reading the history of philosophy that way because it unites the history of philosophy. It's all really there in the texts. Um, if, you know, you don't just read this certain very small set of texts that mostly at least in the US and in Britain, and I indeed in many parts of Germany as well. So those are the only countries I can speak about. You get this very narrow concentration on some questions of epistemology. Um, but uh, actually uh, I showed that the problem of evil runs through the history of Western philosophy, and those are the questions that actually bring real people to philosophy. I mean, you know, you, you, you don't study philosophy because you're worried that the external world might not exist, unless you've got some serious problems, I would have to say. You study, you study philosophy because you're thinking about the meaning of life and the meaning of your life and um, what to do with it. And so the, what I did then, instead of dividing philosophers into uh, rationalists and empiricists was um, dividing them into people who try to explain in one way or another um, the presence of evil, okay? And that made for some very strange bedfellows. Um, you know, weirdly enough, I don't know how many of them would have liked to be put in the same category as the others. Um, but, you know, it goes, there's a line that you can draw from Leibniz, whose solution I don't like, to Kant, whose solution I do, to Arendt's, um, with the idea that making sense of evil is a moral demand. 
and that if we don't try to use reason to make some sense of evil, we are giving up in the face of it. But then there's this other tradition, which I, you know, I, I also respect, um, which, and that again, also offers some very strange bedfellows, which says, no, trying to make sense of evil is betraying suffering, is betraying the people who suffer. And you know, you see that in Voltaire's poem on the Lisbon earthquake. Uh, you see that weirdly in David Hume. I don't actually like Hume, but um, you can see that in his work. Uh, you see that in one of my favorite philosophers uh, who's not as well known as um, I, I try to make him well known, Jean Marie who was actually a prisoner at Auschwitz and wrote about that. Um, at the same time, he also wrote some of the best defenses of the enlightenment in, in 20th century thought, but he, he wrote perhaps his most famous piece, it's translated in English as At the Mind's Limits, suggesting that it's for anybody who was at Auschwitz, it is obscene to try to explain or understand it. So, I mean, this is a tension, the idea it's obscene to try to explain it, but it's a moral demand to try to explain it. That's an interesting tension, which I think is important. I think that it's important to preserve both of those impulses and to respect both of them. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yes, that answers my question because uh, I also have this this how can I say this inner feeling that the, the 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 question about evil doesn't give necessarily answers for us, but uh, ways of thinking and avoid evil in a rational way. Yes, you know, that may, gives us a kind of a responsibility on the world and what happens in the world. And I have another question, but I, I will come to I, it. Okay, I absolutely agree with you about that. And I think, you know, it's not a problem that, um, that has anything like a theoretical answer because a theoretical answer would be in some sense a justification. I just wanna make one point, I, if you're yes. working on Arendt, um, I don't know if you know the work of Bettina Stangnet, but you yes, I know. absolutely read it if you, okay. Yes, okay, good. I love good. it. I love it. Yeah. I have it here somewhere. It's it's, yeah. Yes, she's wonderful. terrific. Yeah. Um, good. She's, okay. she's terrific. Yeah. And she also has a book on the, the evil. No, that's I know. Bruiser. I know. Yes, she's, um, she's great. And she's I don't always great. agree with her, although I generally agree with her line, but I think she's one of the best philosophers writing anywhere today. So. Yes, that's it. So, Professor, uh, I have a question here from one of our researchers, Andrea Venturini, who actually gave the lecture about evil in modern thought. And he asks, like, because in evil in modern thought, you, as you said, you create some kind of very odd bad fellows. Uh, you put, you talk there about Kant, you talk about Voltaire, you talk about Leibniz, Hume, Marquis de Sade. And he asks, uh, and I think you partially answered that question now, uh, he asks, like, who are the philosophers nowadays that you would recommend that talk about the problem of evil? Uh, who would who you be like your your top top three choices? You know, there aren't all that many people doing it. Um, Bettina Stangert is a big exception, so she is someone I would absolutely recommend. Uh, again, um, Jean Marie, just because he's not well known and because one should really try and look at his entire work yes. is I think extremely important. Um, I suppose in a way, Anthony Appiah, Kwame Anthony Appiah is someone, he's another philosopher who I really respect. He doesn't directly talk about the problem of evil, but he does talk about a lot of important moral and political questions that uh, surround it. 
So if you ask me for three, those would would be my top three. I um, I wish there were more. <laughs> <laughs> but well, th that's why I made it easy for you just making like a top three list and not a top 10 so yeah, I, I, I couldn't give you a top 10 I mean it's it's not I, you know I'm sure there are people and perhaps younger people whose work that I, I just haven't run yeah. across because honestly um, I read a lot of things I don't just read philosophy I read a lot of yeah. history uh, anthropology, sociology, literature, I often find that I learn more from the, those fields than I do from philosophy. I think it's still the case, at least in the cultures that I have studied, that academic philosophy is rather confined to a small set of questions, and there's a penalty paid um, for writing you know the way that i yeah. like to write the way that's accessible to people who are you know not your graduate students basically so exactly. you know it's hard it's hard and that's actually part of the question that i'd like to ask you now uh it's a curiosity that i have on the relationship between rhetoric and style in your work and content I mean, form and content sometimes, as we see in academic philosophy, they don't go hand in hand when we're talking about the production of texts. And when I read you, I see that there's a big commitment there, as you say in the, the preface of your latest book, Learning from the Germans, of writing from your experience, not from a position that you want to, to show that history is a subjective experience, but from the position that shows that you as a philosopher, you are writing from the, a certain perspective, a certain, you know, position within the world. Uh, how do you see this relationship between, say, literary style or style of writing and uh, communicating philosophy? Do you see this as, like, at least in your work, as a way for you to pay a tribute to this influence of the Enlightenment that is so big, so present in, in what you write. Is that, that part of it? Absolutely. Or, or, I mean, I could say it was the other way around. I mean, the first philosophers who I actually read when I was 16 and, you know, decided to become a philosopher were, were Sartre and de Beauvoir. Yes. You know, who, <laughs> you know, who both wrote literature and philosophy and didn't see a conflict between them. And that seemed normal to me. Yes. Um, you know, uh, it was a bit of a shock to then, you know, get to university and realize that, you know, it was not the normal way of doing things. Um, you know, although there were a few other people, Iris Murdoch was somebody mm -hmm. uh, who did it, um, you know, and Arendt uh, yeah. writes very well, uh, too, and has an enormous, yeah. you know, sense of literary style. Um, look, I, first of all, I love literature. I have actually, towards the end of working on a novel as well. Um, and I, I think that um, literature, perhaps more than anything else, um, really brings us to consider other people's perspectives, um, gives us an opening to the world that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and I, I mean, it, learning from the Germans differed from my other books in that I really sort of went to town on this. Yes. Um, you know, and began, you know, wrote somewhat autobiographically and also um, interviewed a lot of people, which is not, um, you know, it, it, it was very funny when I was writing the book and I, people would ask what I was working on and, and, you know, I would say, well, I, I'm interviewing people or something. They said, well, what, what genre are you working <laughs> on? And I, and I said, well, at, at, for a while, I said, it's a mishmash, you know? And then um, actually a, a friend of mine wrote a review of the book in which he said, I invented a new genre, investigative philosophy. So I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will adopt that tag. I will adopt that tag. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I have to say, the book has um, it. You know, I'm pleased to say it really has had an impact 
precisely because it does start from lived experience, not just my lived experience, but also because I didn't only want my voice in it from other people's lived experience. I mean, the whole question of uh, this process of facing up to a nation's past, you know, you could write a sociological book about it and there are many that have been written, but what interested me was the way that it impacts ordinary life that I had been experiencing for so long in Berlin, you know, um, Mm -hmm. how people relate to their parents, how they raise their children, what songs they sing, what colors they wear, you know, what food they eat. I mean, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's very detailed. It doesn't, it's not a matter of saying, you know, well, my parents were Nazis and I think that's wrong. So that's it. It really goes into exploring the ways in which a fascist or racist ideology has worked its way into so much of a culture. And most of our cultures, unfortunately, uh, you know, have similar um, questions to deal with. So um, it just seemed really important to Yes. Talk, to go into detail. Originally, actually, I was going to have a third part in which I talked about um, Ireland and British colonialism. And that would have been very instructive to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I actually, I, I, I was the summer of 2016, I was, I visited, you know, like, not every commemoration of the Easter uprising, but many and, uh, you know, I made a lot of notes for it, but my editor thought the book was already too long. And I decided that in order to do the kind of textured analysis that I wanted to do, it would just require a whole different book. Um, that's apart from the fact that Irish, I mean, Irish history is so complicated, but it's also, they've also become so sane in t- <laughs> <laughs> after all these years that, you know, it, it just, but anyway, I do yeah. think that the lessons apply to many countries. But look, it's also clear, I know that there, you know, straight philosophy, um, you know, thinks that, you know, you write in the third person, you're writing sort of universal truths from on high, but actually, you know, Plato didn't write that way. Rousseau didn't write that way. Uh, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, uh, Sartre de Beauvoir, Emerson, I mean, Thoreau, Mm -hmm. there there is a history of people working to connect their own experience to questions that are larger than their own experience. And you know, it draws people in. People like narrative. I mean, even when I read my book, uh, uh, Why Grow Up? I didn't mention it too often, but I think it's pretty clear that I was writing as a person who has children and, (laughs) you know, so has thought about those questions a lot. And um, yeah, and I, I just, I guess I think more of us more of us should try to pay attention to, to style. I mean, you know, just the other, the other thing is, you know, life is too short to read badly written books. And um... exactly, I mean, Goethe has <laughs> Goethe has a very good uh, reported quote by Ackerman in which he tells Ackerman that he should write about what he knows, what he has experienced, because that is what makes a great writer and. I think a great philosopher too to write from, as Isaac Bashevis Singer said, write about your little nook. So that's it. Turn your garden into part of the world. So thank you, Ludmila. Pass it to you now. Yes, um, in the matter of the relationship uh, between literature and philosophy, I have this quote also from Arendt in her essay over, uh, about, <laughs> about Isaac Dinesen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes the, this go a little bit messy here. When she says that meaning, uh, that, that lit, uh, narrative gives meaning without, uh, without committing the error or the mistake of trying to define it. Yes. That's, no? And I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, that's yes, a I think. Essay. 
Yes, it's a, it's a, it's very beautiful. And as continue our question in this Arantian path, I have uh, another uh, thinking about the evil, but nowadays, it's, uh, especially, especially in the elections in the US now, mm -hmm. and in a sort of way, what is happening in Brazil politically, that is, um, for Arendt, evil is a possibility, always open you know, the possibility of doing evil. Politically speaking, do you think the calculation concerning the lesser evil in elections, for example, you know, can be seen as morally justified? Aren't we uh, normalizing evil in a way that um, this tolerance uh, is so high that at some point we are dismissing the fact that it can grow dangerous, no? that we start to accept evil more and more. As Aaron says, you start to choosing the lesser evil, but very quick you forget that you chose evil. You know? So the that this tolerance is growing. So um, I'm going to say something that, again, will sound strange coming uh, from a philosopher, but I think it's absolutely true. And I could even show you passages of Kant that, uh, you know, agree with me. Um, I don't think any interesting question is decided by a general principle. Uh, I think you have to apply judgment and you have to apply it to particular cases. <clears throat> so I'm not even going to try to answer that question in general. I think it depends entirely on the political situation. Um, Joe Biden was not my first, my second, my third choice. Um, you know, uh, I voted for Bernie Sanders in the, in the, uh, uh, what are they called? The primaries. Numbers? Primaries. Thank you. <laughs> I've been speaking German. All <laughs> um, but, yes. um, when it came to the general election, there was just no question in my mind. And I was rather annoyed at certain young people, including one of my daughters, actually. <laughs> in the end, she did vote for, you know, uh, vote for Biden. But, um, you know, the idea that, you know, this is voting for a lesser evil and it's still not what one wants is in the face of fascism and Trump is a fascist. Uh, we are lucky that he's a rather incompetent fascist, um, that he so offended the military um, because he can't conceive uh, that anybody would act for reasons other than material gain. He so offended the military that he can't pull off a traditional military coup. It won't happen. Um, yes, if he were, you know, had been sort of thinking further ahead and been just slightly nicer to the military, we would be in much more trouble than we are now, okay? Um, so, you know, there is absolutely no question in my mind. And, you know, this is another, uh, you know, we know this from 1933, that there were people who, you know, if you had had a united front between the socialists and the communists, you could have defeated Hitler. So, you know, history tells us again and again that you need, and I understand why some communists were not happy about voting for the socialists. The socialists had actually, you know, shot demonstrations of striking workers. So this was not peanuts. It was not, you know, I disagree with you on a, you know, particular, mm -hmm. uh, you know, party platform or something. So, so it's not that I can't understand it, um, but, uh, and of course, Stalin was the one who was against uh, a popular front from the communist side. And Trotsky was right about saying, forget it. This, you know, we're talking about real danger. Uh, I cannot speak about Brazilian politics. I follow it very, very loosely. I mean, all that I've been able to read is that Bolsonaro is actually worse than Trump in yes. some ways. 
So, uh, you know, when, when it comes to, I mean, particularly, and here's, this is, this is another global issue that, that seems to me absolutely, um, you know, it ought to be in the forefront of everybody's political uh, agenda. If we don't stop global warning, warming, um, you know, there's, there's not going to be a lot of room for, you know, progressive politics. And so any politician that's denying global warming um, has got to be gotten rid of. I mean, I can't imagine a, you know, a situation where somebody was serious about um, you know, fighting the climate crisis where I would say, well, you know, but he's not really good on, uh, you know, gender politics. I mean, this is why, I, you know, I love Pope Francis, actually, although I'm Jewish. I'm a huge fan of Pope Francis <laughs> because I think he's got his priorities straight. Um, you know, and the fact that women can't be ordained um, in the church, sorry, you know, I'm I'm I, I'm sorry about that, but it just is not as pressing as the connections that Francis has made between um, the climate crisis and the excesses of capitalism, and you know the refugee crises. Those are and should be in the forefront, and they should be you know in our priorities. So, you know, again, um, I think you have to look at these things very, very particular. You know, the famous quote, at least in English, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. It's just not how, how politics works. Yes, yes, I agree. But the question, what makes me a little bit uncomfortable with this is that in a kind of way, since 2016, we are getting used to two options that one is extremely bad, that's the unvotable, I would say, like Trump or Bolsonaro. And the other one, Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden, they are just the civilized option in face of fascism. And then we start uh, to undermine alternatives like Bernie Sanders to privilege this establishment politics in the way, if you don't vote for Biden, you are helping Trump. So we are faced to the extreme evil or to the fascist. So we start not providing alternatives and ways of doing better politics but we are conforming and voting for the lesser evil and in a certain way, avoiding fascists with all our forces. And, and that's, you know, that's caused me a little bit uncomfortable because uh, I think that with time, with time, we are gonna, we have to, to, to create some alternatives. We can start voting for the lesser evil all the time. And I don't know, sometimes I have this impression that these two um, possibilities, these two alternatives, the extreme fascism and this establishment that also doesn't fit our wishes, they play sometimes a game that one needs the other to survive. And we are in the middle of it without alternatives. I, so I hear you. And this is, <laughs> this is a discussion I, I have with my three adult, very smart children. And I get it, you know, all of them would have turned out, you know, in droves if we could have had Bernie Sanders and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's too young, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, all of them would have been absolutely on the front lines. And so would I, as I was for Barack Obama. Um, the problem is if you're in a situation in which the alternative is absolutely to rule out a framework in which any progressive yes. political action is possible, you have to take action. And then you have to remember, um, you know, political action, uh, you know, voting is the smallest part of it. Yes. Um, 
what happens between yes. elections and organizing around some issue, you know, you can't do everything, but organizing around something that really matters for you um, to push a progressive agenda forward is it seems to me the only reasonable choice when you have these alternatives like Bolsonaro or Trump. Um, I, I, I understand, I understand the, uh, you know, the qualms about voting for Hillary or Biden. I, you know, again, I didn't vote for either of them in the primaries and I can't, you know, yeah, yeah. Mm. But, but you, we, we have to make sure that there is at least a democratic framework yes. in which we can push for social change and, you know, had Trump, again, I can't speak about Brazil, but had, had Trump won that election, um, I, 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 my, you know, it's funny, I never thought he would. And I also was shocked by how many voted for a rerun of this show. But I was like in the, you know, weeks before the election, like my stomach was literally upset. I was just in a, I, I was in a, you know, because I really was convinced and am convinced that, you know, first of all, we could forget about climate change. I mean, about doing anything about climate change. Secondly, you know, he had done so much to undermine law, undermine the constitution, undermine justice, undermine any kind of international cooperation, um, you know, that the, any chance, uh, you know, unfortunately the US still is, I wish it weren't, but it still is the most powerful force in the world. And people yes. like Bolsonaro and Modi and Erdogan and Orban uh, and Johnson um, yes. all, you know, have taken heart uh, yes. from Trump and, and have all said, well, if the American president can do it, then so can we. And so I really yes. felt that if he were reelected, it would, you know, be over for the world. Um, yes. I, I know that's dramatic, but um, no, no, it's yeah. it's the the right word to talk about it. Maybe voting is. That, so, yeah, I have a question that might be related yeah. to some of the things you you've mentioned there, Ludmila and and Professor Neiman. Uh, it's a question basically about the relationship between reason and emotions in politics and how are we supposed to get our priorities straight, which, which I thought it was a very well, a very good way to put it, Professor. So uh, my question is actually about how do you perceive the, the connection between evil and autonomy? How can moral autonomy help us to prevent evil from happening and if moral autonomy is enough uh if uh if moral autonomy is enough to immunize us for the possibility of evil or if there is some kind of uh layer that we should be more aware of the human experience um you know as as, as nietzsche put, puts it conscious is, is just a surface uh is there something else, some darker side of the human experience, of the human emotions that need uh, reckoning in order for us to, to prevent committing the same mistakes from the past? As you mentioned, for instance, uh, your stomach got upset right now in the election of Trump. It, it is an emotional ex response in a way to politics. We are all wired in that. Uh, how do you perceive this this role of emotions uh, in moral and ethical lives? I mean, uh, I mean, I know you, I know you're accounting, <laughs> uh, and I, I'd like to, to hear your perspective on that. I mean, because yeah, you know, I feel like you're asking a question that is totally on my mind ever since the election. I mean, I am still trying to come to terms with the fact and understand why 74 million Americans voted for a repeat of this show. And not only am I not sure how to answer that question, Barack Obama isn't either. I've been reading his wonderful new book um, and I have to say, I, I haven't finished it yet. I mean, it's big but it's so beautifully written like his other books that um, 
you know, it wouldn't be hard to read 700 pages in a week. I'm having a hard time reading it because I find it painful. Um, and it's painful because I was very engaged very early on in his campaign, yeah. just as a volunteer. Um, you know, I didn't play any special role. I just was a foot soldier. Uh, very early on, though, I was one of the first you know, my friends were all making fun of me that, you know, come on, you've lived too long in Europe and African-American. Yeah, you talk about it here in more clarity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an, an African-American intellectual is not going to become president of the United States. And reading his book now, which is a reflection on his presidency, um, you know, it becomes clear he was even better than we thought he was. He, he, magnificent. He's not only smart, he's wise. And the self-criticism and the description of all the thought processes, I'm not even up to the inauguration yet. Um, I'm just still in the campaign. And of course, you know, Obama spoke the sweet voice of reason like nobody's business but he was also able to mobilize emotions involving hope and enthusiasm that uh, you know, not only mobilized millions of young people, I, um, no, I, I could not remember a time in which my generation in, since the 60s, where so many people uh, were, were really thrilled at the idea that this could be, uh, you know, a new world. And of course he underestimated the force of racism. He just did. Um, he's, uh, he wrote that I haven't gotten yet to the, I read an excerpt in which he said that, um, but I haven't gotten to the point in which he goes into it in detail. He probably won't until we get to the second volume, <laughs> which he's still writing. Um, you know, that the racist reaction to the fact that a black family lived for eight years in the White House yeah. and did it beautifully. Um, you might disagree with this or that policy, but it was clear that they did it with grace and dignity and integrity and not the hint of any scandal or, con you know, it, it was just, and that you know, raised envy in white people, certain white people who, you know, had, as you said, you know, these dark views. Um, I mean, partly uh, envy, I, I actually think envy is the worst sin uh, of all. You know, there's seven sins. I think envy is the worst. I think it's probably one of the most destructive forces that there is. Um, and envy of the very excellence of the Obama family, particularly because they were black, um, you know, played a real, you know, decisive role that none of us expected. So I am still coming to terms with that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I just read an article today. I, I spent a lot of my time reading news. I'm going to write a short book about universalism and the left, since that's something that I'm thinking about writing together with a friend, because I really dislike this non-universalist left and think somebody has to do something about it. So, um, <laughs> uh, but I also just read a lot of political commentary. And I was just reading an article today, I think from the Washington Post about, you know, uh, progressives don't know how to use Facebook and the Republicans mastered Facebook and mastered yeah. this disinformation campaign so that, uh, you know, half the country was really living in an yes. alternate reality. Um, how now to try to repair and to find the right emotional um, register, you know, to, you know, to reach people is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that. I don't have an answer for you. I mean, my general answer is, is I don't think reason and emotions are entirely separate and not even content. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Kant thought they were separate, but Kant also writes that, you know, uh, yes, we should do the right thing for reasons, but if we enjoy doing it and if we have the right emotions, all the better. So, yeah. you know, even Kant wasn't such a hard rationalist as people usually, uh, you know, Prudent. think it is. Yeah. But this is, this is the task. And um, I, I'm worried. I mean, I have to say that I'm worried. I, I, I mean, one, my little contribution, or at least my first little contribution to the task is <clears throat> going to be to try to argue against this identity politics on the left, because I think that it gives the right a license to say, hey, they're just, um, you know, they're just honoring their tribe. Why can't I honor mine? Now, exactly. there'd still be white supremacy anyway. It's not that if the left were completely universalist, the right would suddenly wake up and become universalist too. But that seems to me perhaps a contribution I can make to help steer the left in a different direction than we're seeing, at least in the US and in Europe. Um, and, you know, this kind of tribalism has, has already infected, uh, you know, the discourse in Germany. I'm quite surprised, but there it is. Um, yes, there, there are two, two things just like uh, to, to complement your answer and just to pose a short question. Like at the beginning of learning with, from the Germans, you say something very interesting right at the end of the, 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 the preface which is, it is imperative that the rest of us insist that shame can be the first step towards responsibility and with that towards genuine national pride. And uh, well, shame, we could understand shame as a kind of emotion or affect. And I wonder to which extent, uh, I agree with you on that, but to which extent shame is also like, a, a, you know, a, a, a solution that's very uh, ambiguous because, in the end, if we base our national pride on shame, it can also like um, instill resentment in the Nietzschean sense from these people that, for example, as you said, that kind of got horrified by the fact that an Afro-American Black president did so well in the White House. And you see my point? I totally see your yeah. point. And I do have an answer to it. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's so when I first came to Berlin in 1982, the people who were sort of activists and facing the Nazi past, they wouldn't read Goethe. They refused yeah. to touch Goethe because they believed that all of German culture was entirely contaminated. In yeah. fact, the Germans don't like the title of my book at all. The, there have been some good reviews of it, but they're, you know, they're just very nervous about saying that yes. German anything right, although they do now read Goethe, um, <laughs> you know. Well, and... that's good, although the, the 68th generation has a problem with Goethe yet. I mean, it's, it's yeah. very funny, yeah. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, what I, I compare, you know, our relationship to our, our national history, uh, to our relationship with our parents, you know? If you yeah. take over everything that your parents taught you, you're probably not being critical enough um, if you reject it all, you know, you're being kind of adolescent and having a grown up relationship to your parents seems to be you sift through uh, what you took from your parents. You know, well, my mother taught me this uh, and I'm proud of that. And that's something that I'm going to hand on to my children. Um, and this I can do without, you know. Uh, and I, I really do think that the analogy works for countries because... I'm pretty sure that every country, somebody told me that Finland was an exception, but I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure that every country has pieces of its past that it can be proud of and pieces of its past that it can be ashamed of. And, you know, sifting through, um, you know, is, is the process of, of achieving a healthy relationship to your country. Um, you know, one of the, we're talking a lot about monuments at the moment. And for me, the question is less interesting which monuments have to go than what we're gonna put 
in their place because people do need heroes. Now, the US is in a certain sense luckier than say Germany because the US does have a long tradition of the other America, right? Um, you know, from, you know, Tom Paine and Emerson and Thoreau and Frederick Douglass and Woody Guthrie and Paul Robeson. And, you know, there, there is a history of people who specifically said, no, no, I am holding up American ideals against American realities. And, you know, so holding up, you know, honoring those people and finding more of them who are, you know, perhaps less famous than the names that I mentioned, that is part of a project of finding a way to um, to a national pride as well. But we also have to look at the stuff that we would rather not look at. Susan, I have a question for you concerning the, the ordinary man. Um, what do you think of the figure of the ordinary man analyzed by Christopher Browning in his book, Ordinary Man, Reserve Police, Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland? Do you think that this is an expression of the modern, modern evil and can we teach people to think, to be empathetic, to reflect in order to, the ordinary men uh, don't uh, do evil, to avoid evil? Yes. Um, so look, I think Browning, although it's been a while since I read it and I don't remember if he references Arendt, Browning is just a you know, sort of empirical observation of what Arendt was describing. As it turns out, as, as Bettina Stangnet has shown, the actual historical man out of Eichmann was not this kind of thoughtless, ordinary, banal case of evil, but he never would have gotten anywhere had there not been millions of people like the kind that Browning describes. So, so yes, I do think that the vast majority of evil that's committed in the world really is, you know, explained on Arendt's hypothesis. Uh, there are social psychologists say that 2% of the population are sociopaths. I, you know, I, but, you know, once again, um, sociopaths can commit horrendous crimes, but not on the scale that say the Nazis did, uh, or, you know, uh, colonial slavers did without, uh, without the help of other people. Yeah, I do think that we can learn and I think the Germans have gotten much better at it. And the Americans, uh, you know, I, I mean, when 77% of the uh, US uh, population says that systemic racism is a problem after Black Lives Matter, that's pretty, that's a big deal, okay? Uh, and when they're not just answering polls, but they're reading books, uh, you know, huge numbers of books and films that have come out. I, I'm a strong believer in the importance of popular culture. We need to look at our school curricula and all of that. But again, as I, as I think I said earlier, I, I think it is through the narrative arts, that is literature, film, and theater, um, that we most come to have empathy for people who are you know not like us in various ways but then we discover they are like us in some ways too so i i think that's tremendously important i i also wrote about and learning in, <clears throat> from the germans about some of the things that i witnessed in the deep south where and there are groups of of people um quite a lot of them in the us descendants of uh, slaves and descendants of slaveholders, or even just people who are black and white and coming together. And it, it sounds a bit, you know, hokey if you haven't actually seen it work. Um, somebody was asking me about it the other day. I said, well, well, wait, did they just each talk about their own pain? I said, no, 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 that's not where they start. And it's very important that that's not where they start. It's important that they start with some quite 
simple, banal thing that's a way into seeing, oh yeah, this person is like me. I mean, their exercise is like, describe a body of water that meant something to you at your home or you know a landscape or something like that. And then slowly people uh, are asked, so tell us about the first time you really noticed race. And, you know, by that point, they have come to see, okay, there are other things that they share, um, even if race is going to divide them. And then they're able to have more difficult conversations. And I've seen it work, you know? So, yes. Wait, I'm not hearing you. We can have hope. We can teach. No person, no the, the people to well, be look, empathetic first, and to think. First of all, um, I'm a Kantian and I hold hope. I mean, not in absolutely everything, but you know, basically. But I think hope is a moral obligation. Um, if we don't hope, we get resigned and cynical, and yes. that we won't be able to act in a way that would actually, you know, improve the world. But I also. Um, I interviewed Noam Chomsky recently, who gave a much shorter version of that argument without reference to Kant. He said, he said there are two alternatives, you know. Um, you know, if we're hopeless, uh, the world will go down in flames. Yes. And if we maintain hope, there's a chance that it won't. So I don't see any alternatives, said Noam Chomsky at the age of 91. Um, you know, sharp as he ever was, but in, you know, pretty much in lockdown in Arizona. Um, but yeah, we have this to- This is help. perfect. Yeah. It's a very good way to, to say it. Yeah. Professor Absolutely. Neiman, we have here a question from Sharmila, who's watching the, 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 the broadcast. And she's asking, she's saying, you have brilliantly talked about other ev outer events, such as the Lisbon earthquake. Could you talk a bit about evil in terms of inner events by means of diseases such as cancer and mental health, in which there is an obvious, uh, well, scientifically identified and measurable objective subjectivation of suffering because of how people find it in life or not. I, I wonder if she's, she, she's going like in the direction of Zontag, like illness is a metaphor, uh, but uh, that, that's, that's the question for you. So I'll be curious to hear what you have to say about that too. So it's an interesting question because the reason the Lisbon earthquake was intellectually and historically important was that it was a time when people stopped officially at any rate, um, viewing natural evils as evils, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so that included not only earthquakes, but also illnesses and famines and plagues. Um, you know, we can experience them as evils, but, uh, you know, the idea of the Lisbon earthquake was to say, um, you know, let's separate the moral evils that we can do something about, like tyranny or slavery, um, you know, which we can attack with moral means and trying to, you know, make political changes. And natural evils, we're not going to call evils anymore because we'll, we'll treat them as problems that maybe science can solve, okay? Yeah. Um, and now the interesting thing is, although that was a distinction that really got made in the middle of the 18th century, the impulse to um, think about natural evils as evils is very, very strong. People ask, why did I get sick? Or why did, you know, when the, when the tsunami happened in, in 2004, every single religion in the world um, offered a reason for why, you know, the tsunami had happened, offered a kind of theodicy. Even the Buddhists said it happened after Christmas and people were eating too much meat um, in Thailand. <laughs> so I mean, 
Yeah, yeah. So there is this kind of natural impulse. It's what Ludmilla was talking about earlier, I think, you know, to find meaning in something. We would almost rather have an explanation that gives things meaning um, rather than, you know, just sort of leave it to be random and, you know, to have the universe seem utterly, uh, you know, uh, not understandable. What I think is very interesting, and I wrote this, I think in the afterword, I don't know which edition of Evil and Modern Thought you have, probably the Brazilian one. Um, so, but I wrote yeah. a, yeah, I wrote a long afterword to, um, to the last English edition in which I said with the climate crisis, I think the distinction between natural and moral evils is, is breaking down yeah. because it's perfectly clear that it's human action that has caused these, uh, you know, catastrophes, but not with anybody's intention. Um, so that distinction has has broken down, um, you know. But again, we do know what it takes to fix a lot of these natural evils if we had the moral and political will. One of the things that has astonished me is the speed with which they've found a vaccine. And I have a friend who's, she's a historian of science and she knows a lot about the historian of the uh, history of medicine. And in September, and I, I trust her, she's brilliant. And, you know, um, she just knows more about a lot of things than I do. And she said, you know, it will be years before we get a vaccine. Look at the history of medicine. We don't even have a vaccine for AIDS yet. It usually takes ages and then they're not, you know, they're only partly effective. So we're going to be in for a very long haul. And she, of course, unlike me, I'm not competent to judge the data, but, you know, various people have judged the data and, and she said this as well. And what this shows is that if something affects the world and in particular the world economy enough, people find the money to throw at it and fix it, you know? And I mean, that should be a lesson for everyone right now. Um, you know, that, you know, there's this English saying, if there's a will, there's a way. But I mean, if there's a political will um, to solve problems of uh, climate change or of inequality, um, you know, we could do it. Malala, this is one of my little favorite facts that I keep trying to spread around because I don't know what to do with it. So we all know who Malala is because we know that she, uh, you know, stood up for women's right to get an education. But uh, what not too many people know is that after she, you know, she used that education to figure out that you could give, fund 12 years of education for every child on earth on the pr arms profits of the arms industry for eight days, eight days. And it just so happens that after I heard that, I was in a meeting with somebody who is a um, Nobel laureate in economics. And I said, is this true? Can this possibly be true? And he took out a piece of paper and he, uh, you know, uh, somebody who's, I mean, he's, he's not just a Nobel laureate in economics, he's a philosopher, Marcus Sen. And, um, yeah. and he, you know, sort of did some figures on the piece of paper and he said, yeah, that's about right. You could educate every child in the world on the profits of the arms industry for eight days. And, you know, I, I just think it's important to pass information around like that because, you know, we don't have a mechanism. We don't have a decision-making mechanism to say if you, you know, oh, let's have a rec referendum. Would you rather, you know, the arms industry does without eight days of profits. Um, you know, there's no mechanism for that. Uh, Malala gave the speech at the UN 
Um, and I'm just hoping that more people are thinking about things like that. And particularly in the light of the COVID vaccine, you know, we could fix all kinds of things if we wanted to. Thank you. Ludmila? Ludmila, let's go to our last question, please. Okay. I have a question here from uh, Paulo Garcés. Uh, re related to your last book, Learning from the Germans, I'd like to know why Americans took a so long time to treat the racial question with white reaching social movements like Black Lives Matter, while modern Germans deal with Jews question since early the 60s through Vergangenheit's Aufarbeitung movement, meaning, as you said, working through the past and come to terms with the past that observe its duty toward the past with much more care. So there are a couple of trivial explanations of that. First of all, um, you know, Germany lost the war and was under pressure. There was a huge amount of shame in the 68 generation. I, you know, if they traveled in Europe, they would, you know, pretend to be Dutch or Danish or something, you know, so, so that, that certainly played a role. But I think it's much more important to emphasize that the Germans did not do this willingly or automatically. And it took a very long time. Um, you know, it took really 40 years for there yes. to be something like a national facing of that. Now, why has it taken Americans so long? The main answer to that question is because we have a hundred year old hole in our history. And I talk about that in the book from the end of the civil war, which was 1865 to the passage of the civil rights act in 1965. And that hole has been covered up with the euphemism Jim Crow. I'm on a little campaign to try and get rid of that, um, that expression, which lots of African-Americans use too, everybody uses it. Um, and what it suggests is, uh, and it was named after this racist caricature guy in white, it was a white man in blackface who was, anyway. Um, and it suggests, oh, well, the period after the civil war uh, was uh, racist and they had racist stereotypes, but you know, honestly, it wasn't so bad. And white people really didn't know how bad it was. And this was not a case just of, um, you know, individual racism, but racial laws and racial terror. Um, Brian Stevenson, who's one of the heroes of my book, who, who you know, built the incredible lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama, is somebody who has brought the nation's attention to um, the function of lynching in terrorizing the black population from, you know, being, uh, you know, claiming the rights that the constitution guaranteed them, but white people looked away. Um, there were other practices. Um, the, you know, the funny thing is they were hiding in plain sight. You've seen a, a movie or a picture of a chain gang, right? A chain gang, you know, the prisoners chained together. But what I'm sure you didn't know, because I didn't know it until I started uh, this research, is there was a whole penal system that was involved in creating crimes that only applied to black people, um, you know, and arresting them and working them to death uh, often. I mean, the mortality rate in some places was 40%. So in many ways it was worse than slavery because if, uh, you know, if a slave owner paid $1,000 for a slave, he had an interest in at least making sure he had, you know, basic nutrition and so on. But in this system, which was quite vast and lasted all the way until the Second World War, when somebody pointed out to FDR that the Japanese were using it as propaganda, 
and saying, hey, you know, they're not very nice to people of color. That was the point at which we ended this convict leasing system. So, so there was a whole host of things that were simply not taught in any schools that were not sh really shown. I mean, if you saw a picture of a chain gang, you thought, oh, that's pretty awful. But after all, they must be criminals, right? And you yeah. didn't realize yeah. that all this behavior was deliberately criminalized. So, yeah. you know, that history yeah. only began to be seriously discussed um, just a few years ago, I didn't know about it really until about five years ago. And that's, you know, when I started doing this work, it was simply not in the popular consciousness and it is now. Um, so, it, you know, so if you put that together with the fact that actually neo-slavery really didn't end until 1965 in the U.S., although chattel slavery ended a hundred years earlier, we're not doing so bad. <laughs> we have a chance still. <laughs> yes, yeah, there is hope. There, yeah. is a, there is hope. Um, unfortunately, um, we are not going to have time to, to ask all the questions, Professor Susan, because there are many, many questions and congratulations and people thanking you for all your books and your research. So we, I thank you so much for accepting the invitation. It's a pleasure. Maybe you can send me the questions if they're in of English. Of course. Yeah, great, I'm just great. curious to read them because I, I, I loved the questions that you uh, sent me yesterday. And I, I really appreciate the, you know, the thought that you've put into my work. And, you know, hopefully someday I can come to Sao Paulo. Sure. sure. Well, it, it, will, it will be fantastic. Professor Fernando uh, was watching here with us and sends you uh, regards and everything and thanks you. And uh, meninas, muito obrigada. Ju, Lude, muito obrigada por tudo. Muito Susan, obrigada. thank you so much. Obrigada você. Pessoal, a gente thank vai you, ter professor. mais atividades do Labo na semana que vem. Amanhã e depois temos até o nosso seminário Labo de verão. Por favor, não percam. Um beijo grande, gente. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye, professor. Thanks. Bye, Thanks bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.